Greek. All right. Hey, we do have a Zoom participant. That's great. Okay, hey, Bert. Okay, so we're gonna talk about GitHub Actions. Uh, I didn't quite plan a whole methodology here, so it'll be a little bit of muddling through as promised. Okay, first let just big picture, what are GitHub Actions? Um, GitHub Actions is a way for us to um, ask GitHub to do things for us triggered via events that happen on our repositories. It's a very general set of machinery. And um, the, the, way that it, the way that it operates is that we uh, instantiate in our repository, we instantiate uh, workflow files, and then uh, those workflow files are written in a certain kind of configuration language, and they can do different steps. And you can really trigger these actions by multiple different kinds of things. So here's maybe as a way of example, I'll just go to this one repository that I used also the other day, just kind of, and now walk more slowly. So this is an example of a Python library. It doesn't do much by itself. It's got, uh, a function that calculates the area of a circle and a function that calculates the circumference of a circle. And, and that's about it in terms of the Python, but there's all kinds of Python machinery around it. So that's gonna be important and installation machinery and a license and um, all kinds of stuff. But the important piece for us here is this um, directory called GitHub. And so these are all, this is a conventional, not a conventional, sorry, necessary, um, Part of this, there has to be a directory called .github. And in there, there has to be, now it's a bit slow, but we'll get back to it in a sec. There has to be a directory called workflows. And inside of that directory is where we place the workflows, naturally. Been a little slow here, sorry. Um, And once we go in there, and what I suggest we do next, maybe after we look at this one example is we can set up another workflow on the same directory. We'll go sort of through their steps for setting up, up another workflow. Um, and we can talk about sort of specific use cases you have in mind and kind of like battle our way through those. Uh, that can be productive. Um, come on, GitHub, you can do it. Okay, I'll, um, I believe I have it locally also, so I can, uh, Open that up there. Mm. So, um, So notice it's in, because it's a directory that starts with a dot, it's not something that you see just by typing ls in your directory. Instead, you have to type ls a. If you open dot github, well, this is Mac speak, so I'll just do more standard Unix stuff. Uh, in here, there's a workflows directory. In here, there's python package.yaml, and I will use the VS code text editor to open Python package.yaml. We can take a look at what it has in it. Okay. And I actually initiated this uh, from GitHub. Well, I'll show you how you can initiate these from GitHub. That's why it has this 
this is these comments at the top. Uh, it has some name and that's so that you will recognize it in the GitHub user interface. And then it has a, like a rules on when when is this thing run. This will be run every time we push to the master branch in this repository. And it will be run every time a pull request will be issued against the master branch. So that's pretty typical for kind of like test uh, for stuff that you use. Uh, the one use case for GitHub Actions is I want um, every time somebody makes a pull request on my repository, I want the code to be tested, fully tested by GitHub Actions before I even consider reviewing it. This is a pretty good. And then I want to make sure that once that I'm once I merge it, I I the master actually works as expected. That's that's why it has these these rules. And then, so then the next um, section here is the jobs that will be run. And you can actually have multiple, multiple jobs in here. This has one job called build. It's actually not a, not a great name for that, but uh, I think that's okay. I think so. I think I could call this test and that would be just as well, but I'm not sure. We, we should try that. Um, let's try that next. And then, you know, what operating system are you running on? You can actually run here, I think, both on like various Ubuntu's and other Linuxes and also on Mac operating system. And then you have your kind of your strategy and the strategy, there's like the matrix. The matrix is the idea is you might run on a combination of different Python versions and different versions of other things. And it will sort of here, it will kind of for whatever's under here, it'll it'll run all the combinations of things, and you, so you can run multiple uh, kinds of combinations of things here. Um, Python, say Python versions and versions of um, I don't know if you you want to test against multiple versions of NumPy, you can do that here too. Uh, notice that this defines a variable in this namespace that is referred to directly like this. So um, this, is, this is a typical, uh, this is uh, called templating. The, this is a syntax that is typically used for template, templating curly bracket, curly bracket, and uh, again, another curly bracket, curly bracket. And then the thing in here gets evaluated based on the namespace in which it's running. In this case, it's, it's this, um, it's defined by, by, there's this variable matrix. It has an attribute Python dash version. It could have, we could put other things in there. Um, the language, generally the language in which uh, GitHub Action operates is JavaScript. So you can write some JavaScript code here to, to do things. I don't know if I have JavaScript. I don't have in this case, but I'll show you some examples where we're doing a little bit of JavaScript in here to kind of like set up certain rules. Recording. I'm I'm recording. So oh, I didn't see what Bert is saying. So let me see what he's saying. Uh, it's either not screen sharing or not. Oh, I'm not screen sharing. Maybe no, I'm I'm good. Oh, I'm not screen sharing. That's true. Sorry about that. I am now screen sharing. That works, right? Sorry, I thought because I was projecting, of course I was screen sharing, but I was not. Um, so now I'm screen sharing, sorry about that. Okay, so, okay, back to all this at the top. So this is an, an example of one of these workflow, um, uh, cancel, Never mind. One of these workflows, um, right. So from the top, there's the name up here. And then these are the rules I talked about rules before. So there's on push branches master that, determines that this will be, uh, this action will be run when a push is done into the master branch and also on pull request branch of master where um, uh, if a pull request is done against master, this gets run. Um, and then the jobs uh, runs on is what operating system strategy matrix. In this case, matrix has Python version. This is the templating that I was talking about before here, for example, the name of this particular step will be set up Python, and then it'll it'll complete into this into oops, into this name 
the the Python version. Let me actually go back to the repo and you can see what this looks like, assuming the internet works now. I am recording. I was just not sharing the screen, which was uh, also not not great. But now I am. I'm doing both of those things. So initially, I was just talking, and uh, it was recording me just talking about things that were on my screen, but not on on Bert's screen. So. So this is going slowly, but I, I kind of want to show you what this, how this, what this looks like on the other side of things. So look at it from both sides, both from kind of like what it is like on my machine in a text file, but also what it looks like in action. Um, come on, GitHub, you can do it. You can for real. Okay, I'll go a little further here and maybe by the time I'm done here, it'll refresh that page. So, okay, so anyway, there'll be some name of a, a step called set up Python. And depending, it'll do this twice, once for 3.6 and once for 3.7. It's pretty old already. We can add 3.8 also. And I don't know, 3.9. Okay, so I'm adding some, well, we'll see what, ha what happens when I add those. And then um, it uses, this, this is kind of an interesting thing about this. It can use other, uh, other actions that other people have defined to do things. So there's an action set up Python and we're using that action here um, to, so, it does the action of checking out the repository um, up, up front here. So everything uses uses this checkout, setting up Python uses that, and then the Python is, and then after this, these are more, a little bit more freeform. These are a little bit more, they kind of depend a little bit on, um, uh, on these pre-canned actions. This one actions set up Python, that, v2 is like a particular action that somebody else has defined presumably someone in github defined this action um it has a little bit of a, like a docker container feel to it it's similar in terms of the naming it's similar a little bit to the action to the github container naming there's like who is the user actions is like the github actions organization i think that has set up this set up python action and this is sort of like a tag on that. Um, so this refers to a particular, I bet if we went to GitHub and put it in, oh, GitHub is real slow. Yeah, that's very sad. This is not a very good, uh, GitHub being slow are not very favorable conditions for a um, breakout session that relies entirely on GitHub. Um, but let's try this, GitHub, whoop, GitHub, dot com slash action set of python yeah there you go this is so this is a repository that that literally defines this setup python thing that we're using here and this is this becomes really useful when you start making complicated sets of operations and you want to rely on other people's um other people's code that they wrote in order to make these actions so there are repos just like this and actions because it's github actions has tons of these like pre-canned operations that you can do uh, but other people can go and contribute as well and there's there's some there's some source code in here this is i believe it's some 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 variant of javascript in here that does you know things like finding python so here yeah it, it, it looks a lot like javascript that does whatever whatever this thing here knows how to do it, it it kind of takes from that code so it's there's a whole ecosystem of actions that you can compose together and i'll show you a specific example in one of one of our projects that uses one of these in a particular way now this with something is um actually the fact that this action has 
input variables. And that input, it requires that you define an input variable, which is the Python version that you want to set up. So this kind of like mini part of the actions, this mini action within the action is set up Python for me with Python version set to whatever it was in the matrix currently. So you run this several times and each time this, this variable has a different value um, that, that gets then input to this action to kind of instantiate that. And once you've done that, now you can go and do kind of like more freeform things in this case. So there's like the checkout of the repository. So you can think of this part up here um, that it, uh, it checked out the repository from GitHub. It set up the Python and then now I can, I have a checkout of the repository in the repository with Python set up. And so I can run a step that I have defined called install dependencies that has, that runs, this run is, is literally in the Unix shell, run the following commands line by line. So it runs python m pip install dash dash upgrade pip, which will upgrade my installation of pip that came with the, with the Python version that I had. And then using pip, I will install flake eight and pytest, which are dependencies for the testing. I will run python setup.py install, which installs my software. So remember when I, when I landed in here in the shell, I landed inside of the top level directory of my repository. There's a checkout and that checkout, when I ran this, it placed me at the top level so I can run things inside of there. For example, python setup.py install. And so this, this will, presumably install these dependencies that we need, flake it in PyTest and the software itself. So now the next thing is doing linting. Linting in this case means, um, yeah, run flake eight here. Flake eight is a program that checks if the code, if the Python code is flaky and if it complies with pep eight. So we'll run that if my code, for example, doesn't have the right spacing, has, and, and flake eight here is kind of parameterized with a lot of options. It's very, it's very fancy. These, these things here are, uh, flake eight is very configurable. You can tell that I wanna check for these errors, but not these other errors. And that's what all uh, these things are. Um, and it'll it'll build this this I think this configuration means that if there are Python syntax errors, then it will immediately stop. It won't it won't continue running this, and that saves time. Uh, one of the things that that can be bothersome about GitHub Actions is that they take time to run, and if you're not like quickly iterating on changes, then you want to have something that will crash out as as quickly as possible. Okay, and then here it does some additional flakeate. I'm not sure why we're doing it twice, but there we are. Um, and then if, if the linting worked fine, then we will move on to test with PyTest. And that runs the, in this case, the, the built-in um, test code that's in the repository. And this is, this is taking too long. Yeah, it's weird, right? Okay. Thank you. I don't know why that happened. Okay, so so what you see here is um, I could have more than one workflow, but I have only one file called Python dash package, and in Python back, you remember that I called it Python package, and so the workflow here, that title goes, this name up here goes into the GitHub UI into that that name right there, Python package. And in here, I can see what it ran. Um, let's say I go to this run, you can see that there are two jobs and that is defined by this matrix. Um, if I go into one of these jobs, you'll see that the steps here are uh, the steps that are in in here, there's there's one step that is setting up the job, um, but then after that, it runs actions checkout. It runs setting up Python. In this case, um, set up Python three point six from this, 
Um, and then, you know, that's that thing. And then it installs the dependencies. In this case, installing the dependencies fell into a hole and um, yeah, did, did some things. I think what happened is that NumPy stopped supporting Python versions before 3.8. So when I tried to install it on 3.6, it told me that's too old, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And that's that's when it stopped. So, but there's also, you can see there's lint with flake eight, test with PyTest and post setup Python 3.6. I don't know what those are, but those these two are actually lint with flake eight and test with PyTest are kind of our main two core things. So let's, let's do one operation, kind of like one round of operations here. Uh, git diff will tell you that we changed the Python versions, but I'm going to go a little bit further than that and nuke out the old versions and replace them. So git diff now is, I've kind of upgraded the Python versions here. And I'm going to git check out dash B, a new branch that I will call upgrade Python. Git diff again, okay, it's this git commit dash a m uh, upgrade python in github actions yeah if i did git status here it actually tells me there are changes not staged for commit and one careful more careful uh, workflow here would be to git add and then git commit but I'm doing both of those things in one step here. Um, yes, so dash dash a is add everything that's not added, everything that's in here in this in this part of the this this section, and then um, make the commit, git push origin upgrade Python. And it tells me you can make a, a new pull request if you go to this URL. And I will copy that in here and go to that URL. And so now when I push create, when I hit this uh, create pull request uh, green button, it, it looks at here and it says there's no conflicts with the base branch, but then it immediately launches these two builds. And it tells me there's a build, 3.8 and a build 3.9. And it's it even tells me the reason that this build is being launched. It's because of this pull request, um, this pull request condition that I had here. Um, and I can go and look at that. Um, it's setting up things, it's installing, it's actually running the linting already. It's running the test and it's done. That was it. So this one is a pretty quick um, action. Um, I can go and look at the outputs of these things, like the linting. In this case, it's it's actually giving me some warnings here about things that it doesn't like, like I have blank lines that contain white space in my codes. So, but these are not showstoppers, and that's because uh, of the way that I've configured um, Flake Eight to run. It treats these things as I think I don't know all the syntax for Flake Eight, but I think the story here is that. These things are not considered errors, so they're not gonna, these particular errors are not considered errors. So it's letting all these things slide, but it's recording them here and I can go and fix them based on this information. And if a reviewer is very strict, they can go here and say, look, you have to handle these before I'm going to review your code. Notice it built in now on 3.8 and it built in on 3.9. 3.9 looks very similar, but just has set up Python 3.9 instead of set up Python 3.9. Okay, let me pause here for a second and see if this is all so far so good. Yeah, Mackenzie. I originally, I set this up a long time ago to teach this. And at that time, having Python 3.6 and 3.7 was a reasonable thing to do. And then I added 3.8 and 3.9, but then I looked at the logs of the errors that I got a couple of days ago when I pushed it. And it said something about NumPy needing, it couldn't install even the dependencies because Num, or the software because NumPy requires, I guess requires 3.8 and above. So then I removed 3.6 and 3.7 and left these. 
Yeah, and I could add 310. Notice that I add 310 with um, as a string, and that's because um, something about how this works. If I did this, it would look for Python 3.1. Uh, and this works, I believe. Uh, let's put all of them as strings just to be consistent. And uh, I mean, they're still in the same um, in the same branch. I could do git diff and say git commit dash am add Python three point ten as well, and then git push origin upgrade Python would go into the same pull request. So if I go here to the pull requests, it now is running a new action, but now it's running it with three different tabs here. I get 3.8, 3.9, and 3.10. And it sets up Python 3.10 here. It looks like everything is going OK. Um, all these logs get stored at least for some time. So when you go to actions, you have sort of the history of everything that was run for at least for a little bit. Um, oh, it failed on 3.10. Uh, so this is an interesting case where something about the code doesn't work for 3.10, but does work for 3.8 and 3.9. 3.10 is relatively new. So maybe one of my dependencies is, okay, is there some weird thing that's going on here? I don't think. Oh, Cython needs to be installed in Python as a module. There's, there's some error in installing something here. Something doesn't work with Python 3.10. So, you know, maybe 3.10 is too cutting edge. Let's let's remove that. And I should say, every time that I ran this and it failed, I get an email also sent to me that like, this thing failed, go fix it. Oh, no, it's not. It'll run it now. <laughs> It'll go and run it again. Yeah, yeah, it's not clever enough, no. The question is like, is it clever enough to realize that it already, that nothing changed about these and there's no reason to rerun this? And the answer is no, it's not clever enough at all. I think there's a way to cache things, but I, it's, that's more cleverness than. Okay, so now it's green, everything's good. And, you know, somebody could go and review this and say, yes, this is approved. And then go and hit this green merge pull request, but someone with, with the right permissions can hit this. And when that happens, Notice that if I go quickly go here, you'll see that this is now orange. And it also tells me that you can't see this here, but it's um, it's running the action again because I merged into master. And that was another one of the rules here was when you push to master, um, run this again. So this, this just makes sure. Okay, let me, let me um, as a way of sort of showing you a little bit more variety here, I'll go to one of the projects that we work on called PyFQ. Well, actually, let me go back here. Uh, what questions do folks have at this point about actions? So this is this is one very, very typical use case of, of actions, run the tests and only come out green if the tests all pass. Very useful. Um, here we actually have several use cases. We have actually multiple use cases. So we have a few of these. Um, this one is the one you just saw. It's the test suite for this software called PyAFQ. And so it looks very similar. We do slightly different things here about how we run this, how we, we install Nibabel. We install a, a pre-release pre version of Nibabel just to test Nibabel's new releases or installation is slightly more complicated. But other than that, it's generally, it's generally very similar. Um, we, use, we use a conditional here. So you can, use, you can set up the matrix to have, we have two versions of Python, 3.9 and 3.8. Um, we, we run as many as we can in parallel. Our matrix has two versions of Python, but it also has two values 
for the knee babble pre um, Boolean, it's true or false. Notice lowercase true and false, like in JavaScript, because this is JavaScript. And then so here, this step only gets run if matrix.nebabble pre is the true. And it'll run with true and with false. It'll run both, it'll run because it's a matrix. It's, it'll run 3, 9 with true, 3, 9 with false, 3, 8 with true, 3, 8 with false. Four separate jobs for this. And this is helpful to us to know if the problem is with us or with the pre-release version of Nebabel that's currently available. But other than that, this is very similar to what we've seen before. Uh, same use case, uh, generally. But there are other use cases here that I wanted to point out. Um, there are sort of uh, four other use cases to notice here, and I'll just point them out. One is to publish the, the software to the Python package index. So build once we make a release to build the software and, and, and send it to the Python package index, that's this one. There's building the documentation and uploading it to a website. There's building a Docker container of the software. And then there's a whole series here called Nightly. And we separate them into several, which is that we run, when we run this, we don't actually run all the tests. And that's because, that's because our software is this kind of pipeline. It takes a long time to run the pipeline. And so instead of running that, um, in the pull request, we run our master branch every night and run it through several different nightly tests. There's like, so here, just to kind of start with this one, here, instead of being the rule being whenever you make a pull request or every push, it's a cron tab. Um, cron tab is something that the, the Unix operating system has, which is to say it's, a, it's like a table of things that you want to do. On a on a time on a particular timing, uh, and it has its rules. So, so here the rule is on schedule, and the cron definition is this zero ten star star star, which means every day at three a.m. Pacific time, because we're in Pacific time, and we don't we just want to get the message. We want to get those angry emails in the morning when we get up, uh, which is what is happening the last few days to me because uh, we broke something. I don't know. Um, and then here we we set this up. There's like the PyTest that we use here as well has some clever things that you can kind of like pass to it, all kinds of conditions. Run tests that are nightly basic and don't run other tests. Here it's it's this is a PyTest cleverness. You can tell PyTest to run certain parts of your test suite. Um, but other than that, it's very similar to what you saw before. It's just not triggered on. It's not triggered on events, instead it's triggered on a schedule. So that's very useful. Okay, and th that's all these nightly ones. Um, next, let me show you doc build, I think. Doc build, let me just go and remind myself. Yes, doc build, so here's the, um, it starts out very similar. It installs the software, and then instead of running things like Flake 8 or PyTest, it changes directory from the top level directory of the repository into our documentation directory, and then uses uh, make in order to trigger a build of the HTML version of the documentation. I should go back here and just point out to you where it goes to. So in our top level, there's a docs directory. And inside of the docs directory, there's a uh, kind of all the infrastructure that you need in order to build documentation using a system called Sphinx that builds documentation for Python projects. And I won't go into detail here, except to say that it's triggered by, um, by make. So in that action here, um, we're, we're calling that, we're building the documentation locally in that machine. Um, so when we did that, when we run that, it runs, it, it builds whatever it does to do in order to build the whole directory full of uh, HTML files that are website, the website version of the, the documentation. And then we point to this other action called upload artifact. This is this is kind of a neat, again, this is triggered both on push to master and on pull request. Notice that this is the syntax here is slightly different, but it's actually doing exactly the same. It's 
on pushes to master and on pull requests, it will um, it will will trigger this uh, this um, action. Um, so this is an action called upload artifact. I'll show you what it does because it's pretty neat. And what it does is it has a variable named docs and a path. It finds docs build HTML and it uploads everything that is in there into an artifact called docs. And what do I mean by an artifact? So let me here go back to actions and find a recent run of this um, documentation build. So here is my documentation build. Um, here, let me go to this one. So this is stuff John's been working on. And what you notice is that in this interface, there, there is here this, um, this interface that you saw before that sort of shows us what ran and it, it came green, so everything went okay. Uh, but it also contains this other, well, it took five hours to build the documentation. It does because we our examples run through some of the pipeline. It also has an artifact here. If I click on that, it takes me down here and shows me that there's an artifact and I can click on that. And then it downloads an artifact. It downloads a thing to my machine and it's a zip file. It takes a little while to download because our documentation is also in addition to taking a long time to run, it's also not too small. But here it is, here is all the documentation that got built on, um, whoops, two days ago, in, um, in GitHub Actions. So I can go in here and I can go to this index, where is the index? It's somewhere, index.html, and that's the front page of our documentation. Notice it's, it's being read now from inside of my downloads directory. I can go, I don't know, and look that one thing that we might wanna do is go and look and see that the example is built okay, right? So if I'm, if I'm uh, reviewing a pull request that includes, um, this documentation build, I might want to go in here and look and see that the, I don't know, this interactive plot is that the anterior thalamic radiations look nice, and they do uh, in this in this view, right? So I can, if changes have happened to particular parts of the documentation, I can go and look at those in an artifact that gets built. I don't need to build the doc. I don't need to spend the five hours of building this on my machine. Instead, GitHub Actions will build it for me. I can download the artifact that results from that. And that artifact can be can be anything. It can be the result of an analysis, for example, right? If you're automating this to do, I don't know, some kind of multiverse analysis, it runs right that the matrix has multiple, I don't know, random seeds or multiple parameter settings for uh, setting the threshold on something, and you're creating a PDF with um, with a paper. You can upload all these versions of the paper into these jobs, and that could be a cool, interesting thing to do. Um, so that's the documentation build. Oh, and I'm back here for some reason. I don't want to be back here. I want to be in PyFU. Okay, PyFU. Okay, let me go back to PyFU. Okay, so that was a little different. So there's, uh, I showed you cron jobs. I showed you doc builds. I showed you tests. Let me show you this published to test. PyPI. Oh, I should actually show one more thing here in doc build because I, I skipped to the artifact, but I didn't actually show you the one last thing, which is kind of neat as well, which is um, sometimes you want to trigger some parts of your action on events that happen in your repository that are not actually mentioned here. Uh, so this part here, what this part here does is it takes that built, um, the built documentation and it uploads it to our website. And we want that to happen only once for every release cycle. We want it to be just on the released tagged release version. And so what this conditional does for us is there's actually a variable in this namespace called github event.ref, which refers to sort of the references that Git stores in there. I'm not exactly sure, but I do know that when that thing starts with refs tags, that means that the event that just happened was a tag event. And we only tag releases. That's kind of part of how we use the system is we never tag anything except our released, uh, release versions. And so whenever there's a tag there, that's a release. And whenever that happens, we use somebody else's action. This person, James Ives, had a GitHub pages deploy action that they wrote and it has a tag, it itself has a tag releases v3 that we're using. 
and it has kind of like input variables. One of these input variables is an access token, right? That's because we don't want anyone to be able to push to our uh, website. We want to, that to be only approved people. And we want to make GitHub Actions an approved person. And so in our repository, under the settings, uh, where are they? Under the settings, I'll just point to where it is. I don't think I'm showing anything too bad here. There is a, um, somewhere here, there's a secrets. Here it is, secrets section. And in that secrets section, you can store secrets. Um, and so, for example, we've stored an access token here that is used. It's a password, essentially, that we've stored in our repository. And so every time that we push a tag, and only approved people can push tags, this access token gets used by this action to um, push our documentation into a special branch called GH Pages. So we tell it, take the fill folder under docs build HTML that was built in this previous stage and, uh, and upload it into a branch, a special branch called GH Pages. And it's set up so GH Pages is, is a thing that GitHub knows about. It's a convention for, it's not a convention, it's a technical thing that GitHub implements. Things get, that get pushed to GH, to a, a branch called GH Pages become a website. If there's, if there's an index file in there, index.html, that will be the front page of the, of the website and everything will be relative, all the rest of the website will be organized relative to that, that front page, that location. And so this, I don't know what, I don't know exactly what this does. I hope it doesn't send our uh, secret access token to this person, James Ives, but it's their code that does whatever. It takes this variable, this variable, and this variable and does the magic of generating um, this web page which is the kind of like the front page of the documentation. And this kind of URL with yetmanlab.github.io is, uh, is that's kind of like the web pages that these GH pages branches create for a repository that's called, that's under Yetman Lab. The Yetman Lab organization is called PyFQ. So it's all, it all makes sense. I need to put the target out to I don't think these are order dependent and they're, they're often you'll kind of the way I get to these things is I Google for like um, I'll show you but but you go to this web page James Ives is a username github pages deploy action is the action and you kind of need to look here and see what this person says about um, how to configure this right uh, they're going to say there's a folder. You need to give me something called token. Uh, there are optional choices like branch, right? You'll see that this has changed, and I think that's because this page already reflects a later, a later version of, um, a later version of this this action than the one that we're using. So it's lower cased, but but when we when we started using that, it had these all caps. Um, these all caps, but and I don't think the order matters here. I think it's it's you can think of these as like input variables, but not in in order specifically. Yeah. So then you can Google. I don't know, like um, GitHub action. I don't know for um, Docker building, which will be the next thing I'll show you, and then it'll say like. Uh, Maybe somebody has an action for that. This was not a great one. <laughs> GitHub actions for LaTeX. Um, here it is. There's this person created one called LaTeX action, which takes some files and presumably builds them using LaTeX on the back end of it. Uh, so you can Google that and somebody has done, and then you would put into your thing, you would put like uses this person's action, uh, this username slash this name of the action at a particular tag. And then it has its with, in this case, I don't know, with uh, root file or the file, these files, it's not kind of like how to use it. And there's, so people have built actions for all kinds of things and published them. It's very, it's all very nice. 
But I also mentioned that you can, if, if you know how to install all the dependencies to build a LaTeX file and run LaTeX on the command line, you could just write the thing with a bunch of run commands here. You don't need to use other people's, you don't need to write JavaScript. You can, if, if this is something that can be done in the shell, you can do it. And so that means anything pretty much. Yes, what is data yeah, the question is when when will I get shouted at for using resources? As long as this is open, they don't shout at me or they don't charge me. If this is on a private repo, at some point they'll just send me a bill, right, for the compute, which is easy. They have my credit card because I have private repos. Oh, it's easy for them to charge me. They actually enjoy it. Um, not a problem. They will, however, on these open things, they will throttle me. Meaning I can only run so many jobs in parallel. So if, I don't know, this is something that's plaguing us with this other project that I work on, DiPy. Uh, DiPy uh, is complicated. It's a really complicated piece of software if you're doing it in Python. So we have all these, we build all these different things. Um, just the stable build is like, um, I'm trying to see what, what would, Anyway, we try to run a lot of jobs at the same time every time that we do something. And so, you know, five of them will start and then we'll have to wait for those to finish for the next five. It just takes time. So they throttle us. Yeah. So I noticed that you've been using pip install, install, specific dependencies, mm -hmm. and then the packages are hard coded into the, the line. So is that what you would recommend, even if you're running a workflow from a a folder that has a fun drive on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, for all these, for all these software packages, we make it possible to install them with pip. And then here we install them with pip and we're kind of happy with that. Uh, this I should say are not, it's not that I've hard coded dependencies. These are versions of their, their, their configuration options for this software. And here we're just installing all of the configuration options, which installs a whole slew of dependencies that are then defined. I didn't, yeah, Python package configuration gets complicated. I showed you a few days ago, the setup.py. Uh, here we also have uh, setup.cfg file that defines all these various ways of installing. So when I run the dev installation and installs all these dependencies that are in part, yeah, it gets it gets a little hairy for sure. But would you say that like because this is still a config file, we could have that or design to be Honda and then set up I yeah uh, I would recommend trying to use the pip installation if you can get away with it. If something that you require needs conda, I don't think it's too hard. Yeah, I'm sure there's a let's see GitHub Actions conda um, set up mini conda. So this one seems like maybe it's the right one that would then. Uh, Right, if you had uses conda incubator set of conda with activate environment, and this will create a name. Then, anyway, it looks like others have kind of already. So, the, this I would probably, if I was using doing conda here, I might go this way first and try it out. And yeah. there's like only one way to implement Yeah, okay, so that's. Okay, so I showed you that we can build documentation, we can test, we can do these nightly things. Uh, next, let's, let's go to this Docker thing. Docker, I think it's fairly straightforward here. Well, it's got, it's got some, some setup things that I honestly don't exactly understand. Um, and the way that we build our Docker actually is because we wanna tag it with the particular commit um identifier this this long string of letters and numbers that git has this comes from here so we have a script we have inside of the inside of the repo we have a little shell script that takes as input that commit sha 
and it knows where to, this NRDG is a different GitHub, just to confuse everyone, including ourselves. It's a different GitHub org than this Yetman lab on which we actually store the, the Docker container. Right? The thing, the important thing to kind of point out here a little bit is that GitHub has their own, you saw when, when Noah was talking about uh, Docker, you saw him pushing to Docker Hub, but GitHub have their own container registry um, such that, for example, this is my group's GitHub organization and RDG, and we store the packages here. So there's there's a, a whole container, a Docker container registry inside of GitHub under ghcr.io. So if you do Docker pull ghcr.io and RDG, and this container, it's a different thing, not not uh, if not PyFQ, but this other thing latest, you'll get that container. And it all integrates very nicely. Of course, we're locked into this GitHub thing very, very tightly from all directions now, because we do everything on GitHub, but uh, that's uh, we, we enjoy that also. So here, here I'm using this Docker login action uh, to log into this other registry with this username and again a secret that is our in this case it's a, like a personal access token it's a, another kind of secret that lets us then log into this registry and then here we're we have a docker push script as well so it's a little it's a little baroque to be completely honest but um it lets us build docker images and um and push them with a particular tag. Um, sorry, a particular, yes, particular tags. We do this every time that, um, also with every commit into a pull request or, uh, or when things get pushed to master. Um, specifically, so we build the tag to image every time, but if we're pushing into master, we also push that. Every time we merge a pull request, we push a new version of this Docker image with current state of master. In user versus the web, I mean, both, both users and run not. Yeah. Right. So run is run this on the command line, run this shell script, for example. Uses is run whatever this thing runs. This is like, you can think of this like a function, JavaScript that has some inputs here. So uses is like, is use this other action, do this other action that somebody else wrote and run is, is, is more straightforward. Is, yeah, run this thing, like th these commands here. Yeah, this is uses is use this other action and run is run this action. Um, yeah. Yeah, and this it apparently requires some some setting up some dependencies of Docker that I don't know what they are. Himu and Buildex. Once you do that, you have Docker can run here. So the Docker containers, and I guess if you built the Docker container here, you could also run it here with some inputs. Say it again, sorry. Yeah, I think they sandbox things very tightly. I would hope they sandbox things very tightly. <laughs> yeah. And my guess is this is sandboxed so tightly that uh, you couldn't possibly see. The, the risk, I think the risk uh, JB is pointing out is that if you're running Docker on a machine, that that's a pretty, uh, it's actually a pretty high level of, uh, of permissions such that you can actually see memory on that same machine that you're running on. You can see other people's memory. If there are other users on that machine, for example, you can see their memory. You can read variable values in their memory. And this is running on some cloud infrastructure, presumably in Azure, because this is owned by Microsoft. Um, and maybe you're running on a big compute server where a hundred other people are running things. Why can't you read their 
I don't know what they're running there. I don't know if they're running some credit card transactions on the same server. Why can't you read their credit card numbers out of it? But my guess is that it's probably sandboxed pretty tightly. But I, I don't know, yeah. Because it, be it as it, it may, they let us do it. I mean, yeah, some, some of you, if anyone has here has tried to run Docker on a shared resource in your universities, know that IT administrators will not let you do it for that reason. Uh, but here we're allowed to do it. Uh, and I, I, there is also a way to run singularity in this. There is a, a GitHub action for singularity, of course. So that's Docker. I'll do just one more here just to show you the versatility. This is publishing Python. It's going to look very similar. I run some stuff up here. This one I copy and pasted from somebody else. That's why I got these cool emojis here. I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it uses an, somebody else's action. It's actually PyPA is the Python package packaging authority. It's like the folks who kind of design, and I, they they're the ones who wrote this thing. And so it's it's written to their specification exactly. And again, there's a secret here. The secret in this case is a password to the Python package index. And again, this is conditioned on a tag. That's what our releases are. Each tags. And yeah, I think that's all there is to say about this, pretty much. Um, oh, why does it have this and that? I don't know why this is different from the vertical line. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it is. You know, it could be that this signifies very likely actually looking at this, that everything here is going to be one line. There's one line of code. And previously I had each line was a separate line of code. Yeah, it looks it looks like it. Yeah, we could make sure we can get um, trying to the final Oh, good. Happy to hear that. Um, yeah, and then this is, so every time we push a tag, Two things actually happen at the same time. One is our documentation gets built and pushed into that website that I showed you before. And the other is the software gets built and pushed into the Python packaging index. And from then on, anyone who installs our software gets that version. OK, uh, what questions do folks have at this point? I guess with that infrastructure, I agree every uh, two good places is merged so that you just see one cell, one you create the package, put the package. Or you do want to do that? Yeah, some projects. You have actually yeah, every every merge is, is a version of the software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bad, actually. Like uh, if you merge it into master, it's ready for public use, presumably. It's a little, it's a little heavy handed, but, uh, but there are, there are, there are software packages. Yeah. Uh, there is, yeah, there are, so there are other services that will do this. I, I don't use Circle CI a lot, frankly, because I don't understand it. Um, but that's my limitation, I think. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> other people seem to understand it. It's just doesn't, it's very, very Docker oriented. It's very much like built around Docker packages. And I know, for example, Russ's lab, uh, I think, for a lot of their project, they use they use Circle CI. I think it's more performant than GitHub Actions in terms of just like how much compute you can run. I never managed to wrap my head around it. I haven't I haven't uh, tried enough. Also, honestly. Yeah, so that's just to kind of reiterate here for folks on Zoom and on the recording is there's a whole history of this of like, um, and 
John's mentioning Jenkins, which is kind of like the Ur, uh, a grandfather of all these systems. And there was something called Travis that was also for a while. I used Travis a lot for a while and then that faded away. And Circle CI kind of emerged during the Travis phase to just be like a much more powerful thing. And out of all these, none survived the this GitHub Actions, like once they put it into their into their service, no one could really compete with that very well, except Circle CI, which seems to still be alive and kicking. And that's because their devotees, like like Ross's lab, are are pretty convinced that it's it has some advantages, um, which, like I said, I don't exactly understand. But uh, that uh, that's just a, it really honestly is just my limitation. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah. This stuff is like, you can do crazy, lots of really cool, crazy stuff with this. Um, there's someone called L. O'Brien, who's a graduate student here at UW, and then went to work for a kind of like machine learning uh, as a service company. And she made a bunch of videos showing how she runs all kinds of machine learning tasks on GitHub Actions. One of the things you can do is you can point GitHub Actions to another computer. You can register a runner, as in you can say, here's a machine in AWS. Instead of running on your infrastructure, could you run this on my machine on AWS instead every time I push? She's, and she shows how to do that to like run, trigger, um, like trigger neural network training <laughs> on every push to the repository. And then posts, she does, cool stuff like every time that the, the action is run, it pushes an image into a pull request with the current like training curves, mm -hmm. right? So you, every time you change your, every time you change your neural network architecture, it runs the training and pushes learning curves into your, into your pull request. So you kind of get like the <laughs> continue, you don't need to run your code at all. You just push it and it runs and so you can do put together like crazy, Machinery with this, yeah. Cool. All right, I guess maybe we can break here and. Great. Yeah, and feel free, definitely feel free to like digest this and then ask me when you're like trying it out. All right. Bye, Bert. Thanks for joining.